Hi, my name is Alex, and today is a Microbial Monday. So let's jump in. Let's go viral. It was the year 1967, the year of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Six Day War, and the first successful heart transplant. Also, Canada's Expo 67, the release of the first issue of the Rolling Stone magazine, and the appointment of Thurgood Marshall to the US Supreme Court. It was a pretty busy year, and that's not all. This was also the year that a new virus made its way into Europe. 1967 was a year in which polio was still pretty heavy on the minds of virologists. That was why researchers at the Beringwerke, excuse my accent, which was a vaccine producer in Marburg, Germany, or in 1967 terms, West Germany, they were hard at work there making polio vaccines. And in order to do this, these researchers were using grivets, a type of monkey that lives in savanna woodlands. Monkeys, or monkey cells, can be really useful experimental models for developing vaccines and other treatments against human diseases. Because biologically, we're, we're pretty similar to each other on an evolutionary scale. And that means that the cells that make up human bodies, including human immune systems, are relatively similar to the cells that make up monkey bodies. And that's why, simultaneously, laboratories at the Paul Ehrlich Institute in Frankfurt and the Institute of Virology, Vaccines, and Sera Torlak in Belgrade were importing grivets via the same Ugandan supplier. But unbeknownst to the importers or the researchers, polio wasn't the only virus around. In fact, there was a problem with these monkeys that they were planning to use to study polio. These monkeys were carrying a previously undescribed virus, the Marburg virus, as we later came to know it. Marburg virus is a nasty one. At first, it will cause a sudden high fever, complete with headaches, muscle pain, and general malaise. At its worst, though, like the related Ebola virus, Marburg virus can cause a deadly viral hemorrhagic fever, meaning that the patients start to pretty much bleed out of all of their orifices as their organs shut down. It's awful. And all of those symptoms were what doctors in Marburg, Frankfurt, and Belgrade started to see in employees that had handled contaminated grivets or their organs or their blood or other cells. The eponymous Marburg was hit the hardest with 24 people infected with the virus. There were also six patients in Frankfurt and two in Belgrade. The key difference that may explain why Belgrade was hit less hard by the virus than either of the two locations in Germany was preemptive quarantine. While the monkeys were sacrificed for laboratory experiments soon after arriving in Marburg and Frankfurt, they entered a quarantine period upon arrival in Belgrade. And there, during the quarantine, that's when it became clear that these monkeys were very sick indeed. A full third of the grivets died on, in Belgrade. This was quite suspect. So an experienced veterinarian employed by the Institute of Virology performed autopsies on some of the dead animals now, this was a great idea to investigate what was wrong with the monkeys and find out what should be done next, but it was also the source of the two cases of Marburg virus disease in Belgrade, because this veterinarian was in general very careful. He double masked, yes, it's been a thing since the 60s, and he wore goggles, rubber gloves, a rubber apron over his lab coat, and even rubber boots covered in extra plastic sheets for protection. After performing the autopsies and placing specimens into petri dishes for later analysis, he left the surgical room with the dishes, washed his hands, and showered. But he made one nearly fatal mistake. While placing a piece of grivet liver into a petri dish, this vet didn't notice that he'd accidentally contaminated the outside of the petri dish with grivet blood. It was only once outside of the surgical room after handling this petri dish without gloves, that he noticed some of this blood on his palm. Now it's not entirely clear how the grivet blood got from the outside of the vet's body to the inside of it, 
maybe through a small and undetected cut on his skin or by touching his face. But what is certain is that this unlucky veterinarian was infected with Marburg virus. Both him and his wife, who was his caregiver while he was sick, during the first milder week of his illness anyways, prior to his transfer to the University Clinic of Infectious Diseases, both of them contracted the virus. But luckily both survived. And actually both of those patients in Belgrade received a transfusion of plasma, which is a component of blood that contains antibodies, from a recovering patient from the West German Marburg virus outbreak. Getting transfusions containing antibodies from previously recovered patients can help the immune system of the sick person control the virus and can make the difference between life and death, especially with brand new viruses like Marburg at this point that we aren't sure how to treat. In the end, it was very lucky for us humans that although Marburg virus is very deadly once you get infected, it's not nearly as infectious as say SARS-CoV-2. It doesn't transmit by air. Rather, like Ebola, it transmits by a very close contact. For example, by contact with bodily fluids from an infected person. That's necessary for the virus to jump from one human or one monkey to another. We were also incredibly lucky that the virus didn't escape out into more cities along the travel route of the Grivets. After patients started getting sick, and after contact tracing revealed that they had all had direct or indirect contact with grivets that were shipped together, the root of those suspicious monkeys was traced. It was anything but direct. Because of the Six Day War, the grivets were diverted to London Airport before going on to Frankfurt. To delay matters further, there was an employee strike on at the airport in London, which meant that the animals were temporarily housed there for a few days. In one of the review manuscripts that I read to prepare for this video, I came across the dispassionate scientific sentence, fortunately, the monkeys did not distribute the virus in the London population. Fortunate indeed. If we look back at this outbreak from the viewpoint of 2021, it's easy to see that we've come a long way since the Marburg virus outbreaks in 1967. I actually work in a biosafety level three lab, which is a high security lab where we work with particularly dangerous microbes like HIV. And you would have to make a very long series of very serious protocol errors to be contaminated in the way that the veterinarian in Belgrade was. That's because we know so much more about viruses now and about how to protect ourselves from them. Thanks to research such as that which was done in the aftermath of the European Marburg virus outbreaks. But what I think was particularly laudable about this example of a viral outbreak was the relatively quick and open communication between the Yugoslavian team and the West German team to make sure that this outbreak was contained. Information was shared, an emergency panel of experts was called, and this resulted in that transport of plasma from a West German patient to Belgrade, where it saved the lives of the Belgrade patients. But take from this what you will. But I thought it was interesting to look back on a previous outbreak from years ago when we knew less about viruses. And maybe this will be the start of a series on Microbial Mondays YouTube that looks back on scientific research or pandemics outbreaks from our past, which we learned from or didn't. Thanks for joining me here on Microbial Mondays and I'll see you next week. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe because there will be many more Microbial Mondays. And if this wasn't enough microbiology for you, you can also check out my blog, microbialmondays.com, where there's a whole other story about microbiology waiting there for you every Monday. See you there.